table. Mashed potato is a term I prefer for the genre that uh, we, we also know as the fairy tale, but the fairy tale in my usage is a literary version of oral tale. And, and I may also use the term version from time to time, but probably just for variety uh, as opposed to, to magic tale. And a magic tale to me seems to be the best, the best name for this kind of genre in which magical transformations, magical um, uh, episodes of various kinds of occur. So, it's well established that within the genre of magic tales, and as recorded from storytellers and classic face-to-face -face communities in Europe and North America, male storytellers have preferred to tell stories of male heroes, poor young boys who rise out of poverty's ashes, defeat powerful adversaries in worlds beyond their home, and marry a king's daughter. Their stories end there. And they had babies in basketfuls and lived happily ever after. <laughs> Indeed. This is the paradigm of the male-centered tale. Women narrators, however, have been shown to tell both male-centered and female-centered magic tales. These feminine tales begin where the masculine tales end, with a wedding. The poor heroine is met and married her higher status husband, but then because of opposition from powerful figures, often female, within the new social world she has entered because of her marriage. She loses him, and the rest of the narrative tells how she must suffer, scheme, and outwit her enemies to find her lost husband and restore their marriage. In this paper, I explore some of the tales recorded in Newfoundland by Herbert Halpert and John Lewison in the 1960s and 70s in the light shed by Ben Colbeck about the relationship between folk tales and reality. Holbeck's book, Interpretation of Fairy Tales, appeared in 1987, too late for it to influence Halpern and Willison's Folk Tales of Newfoundland, which came out in 1996, but which had been essentially finished uh, in 1986. This magnificent collection, while unsurpassed in terms of its comparative annotation by Halpern and the detail of its transcription and attention to performance by Willison, was cautious in the extent to which it speculated on social media. It invites further close reading along the lines suggested by Holman. For those unfamiliar with the late Danish folktale specialist, I recommend the capsule version of his thesis in the essay The Language of Fairy Tales in the line of Friedland and uh, Sainsdorf's Nordic Folklore Recent Studies, 1989. In particular, consider the following. Holbeck lists three thematic oppositions in magic tales. Number one, problems of the young in the parental home, being subjected to sibling rivalry, incest, tyranny, for example. Two, meeting the romantic partner and liberating them from attachment to their parent of the opposite sex. And three, forcing the older generation to recognize the marriage and give over control of the kingdom to the younger generation. Olmec states, all of these problems are real or possible events in the communities in which fairy tales are told. At the same time, all of them are sensitive, even painful, subjects that cannot easily be brought out into the open. Potential conflicts with actual relatives and in-laws are only too obvious. The tales solve the problem of dealing with these matters by treating them as if they were events in a purely fictitious world, and by disguising the participants whereas the nature of the conflicts is hardly disguised at all. In the period since Holbeck's work appeared, others have advanced similar interpretations or arrived at them independently, for example, James Taggart in Enchanted Maidens, and in what must have been one of his last essays, Alan Dundee has explored the mother-in-law as the hero's opponent in fairy tales. Rather than elaborate on these theories, however, I will offer some samples of the Holbeckian reading of some Newfoundland tales, which are female-centered in whole or in part. The title of my paper relates to a story which appears in Folk Tales of Newfoundland, told by Mrs. Elizabeth Brewer of Freshwater for Central Bay in 1976. It is framed by rejection. At the tale's opening, in a husband's rejection of his wife because he blames her for infertility, they were a long while married, never had no children, so her husband was real nasty to her. And near its end, when Peg's husband, the prince, rejects her because of her apparent ugliness. He was never, never happy, 
He was always crying and all of that. So one day she said to him, she said, you don't want me. And he said, no. In between these twin projections is the story of how Peg Bearskin is born of the third of three daughters conceived after her mother ate three fruits on the advice of one man. The first two fruits were sweet and the daughters were beautiful. The third, which she had been forbidden to eat, tasted bitter as gall, and Peg was born big, ugly, and hairy. So they named her Peg Bearskin. Peg is also rejected by her sisters. Nobody like Peg, no one. When the sisters leave home, they throw stones at Peg as she follows them, but Peg saves their lives when they shelter for the night in the witch's house. Peg takes the nightcaps off the witch's daughter's heads and puts them onto her sisters while they sleep. The witch wakes up and kills the sleeping girls who are not wearing caps, thus killing her own daughters. This is the first of four episodes in which Peg acts as a trickster, destroying or stealing the old woman's family and possessions. To arrange marriages for two sisters with the king's sons, Peg provides what are in effect dowries for them. The king commissions Peg to steal the witch's decanter that can never be emptied, a lantern that shines half a mile on a magically swift horse, the last being to so that Peg may marry the king's youngest son. In committing these thefts, Peg throws pepper in the witch's husband's face to distract him as she snatches the decanter, and she pours salt in the old woman's soup so that she must send the servant to the well for water where Peg can grab the lantern. The witch's domestic order is overturned by Peg using these arguably feminine, feminine materials, pepper and salt, to disrupt this older woman's household. In the final theft, she tricks the witch into thinking she has Peg imprisoned in a sack, but actually it contains the witch's dog, cat, and crockery ware, which the witch beats unmercifully. Thus she turns the older woman's aggression against herself. The old woman is undone by her own malignancy. A Holbeck-inspired reading of this version of the tale might suggest it represents the feelings of fear and aggression a young out poor woman might feel as a new servant in a big house in the city. There are wonderful new artifacts in this household, but also a malignant old woman in possession. There are new social possibilities, even glittering marriage prospects but they demand courage and deception. Even after the prince has been won, the marriage is not at first happy. Peg's husband is repelled by her physical ugliness. She tells him to throw her on a fire and burn her, which he does after mild hesitation. But after she is given the half ring, which will identify her when she returns after her fiery makeover. And the beautifulest lady that ever the sun shined on. And the marriage is resumed happily ever after. Mrs. Brewer's second version, though more mutably in the previous version she told her, and well, that was his wife then. Without knowing more about Mrs. Brewer and her experience of marriage than any story collector might have the nerve to inquire, we don't know if there's any significance in this difference. One of the perils of reading oral texts, as if they were written ones, is to read too much significance in what may be happenstance aspects of a tale's performance or texture. Holbeck wisely kept his analysis at the level of structure, where there's a better chance of objectivity. If his theory is an accurate explaining explanation of how tales were read or listened to by the audiences, we must accept that they were open texts, which every individual listener would have understood in a somewhat different way, according to current preoccupations or past experience. And of course, there's a lovely new interpretation of the thing bears in by Greenhill in her new book on Queer Grimms. The tale type, which I'll now turn to, um, is um, ATU 313, The Magic Flight. This is a tale which appears the most frequently in folk tales of Newfoundland. There are seven texts from six narrators in four communities. It supports all that argument that magic tales are about two young people how they must learn to trust each other if their romantic partnership is to endure the obstacles placed in their way. The tales begin when a young man is testing by a powerful, malevolent, and deceptive older man, another magician. He imposes impossible tasks, and each time the young man breaks down in despair and is only saved from execution by the intervention of the older man's daughter, who has magic equal to her father's. Thus, the first part of this tale time to generalize these different versions is masculine, is masculine 
representing in that distanced manner which Holbeck identifies, a young man's struggle to establish his capacity as a working man, or to mollify an unreasonable employer, or a hostile father-in-law. As the tale proceeds, however, the role of the daughter becomes more prominent. She tells Jack, the young man, exactly what to do in order to evade her father's traps. And he must learn to take her instructions and follow them to the letter. Most strikingly, this extends to apparent murder, just as Peg Bearskin told her husband to throw her in the fire and burn her. When Jack, in the Newfoundland text of ATU 313, is set the task of climbing a slippery glass pole, she tells him to knock her on the head with the hammer or axe she gives him, or to cut off four of her fingers, so that from her body will spring a ladder of bones or fingers, up which he can climb. What is this about? A literalization of metaphor that a man will walk all over the woman. The woman is a branchy tree, as folks on the lyric has it, from which a man will pluck what he can find. Yet it's her idea, and in the stories in this tale type, in fact, throughout the depiction of married life by male narrators in folk tales of Newfoundland, the women characters are presented as inherently smarter, more intelligent, more far sighted, more strategic in their thinking than their male partners, who are shown as brave but a little thick. <laughs> as a failure to follow the girl's directions to the letter, resulting in a crooked finger for her once she's magically reassembled after the pole has been climbed. Four of the six Newfoundland narrators close this tale with the episode of the forgotten fiancé. Having escaped from the girl's father, a pair of life at boy's home. She tells him not to let anyone kiss her, or he'll forget everything about her. In most versions, a dog jumps up and licks him counting as a kiss, and she is immediately forgotten. The tale is by now far more feminine than masculine, in that she is following the girl's attempts to reawaken her husband's memory of her. She achieves this by telling the story of how she saved him in each of his perilous tasks, sometimes illustrated by a rooster pecking at a hen, until he finally remembers it. This is not the only tale type in the collection to include a final task for the woman of regaining her lost partner. ATU 551, The Water of Life, um, known as the Queen of Paradise Garden, among other titles, to his three tellers in the Newfoundland book, concludes with the heroine tracing the man who has made her pregnant back to his parents' home, where he is reverted to his juvenile status as a pantry boy, or a raggedly dressed youngest son. Thus, there's a recurring theme in the Newfoundland versions of ATU 313 and 551. The loss of the new love relationship once the male partner returns home, where implicitly he falls back under the sway of his mother, becoming a boy again instead of accepting his new responsibilities to his romantic partner. This idea appears even more insistently in the version of ATU 425, The Search for the Lost Husband, recorded from Alice Lannan as the big black wall of tree, to which I will turn in a moment after considering one more prominent Newfoundland tale plus. And this is a series of novelli rather than magic tales in that they have no magic episodes, all the narrative added events being accomplished by tricks and coincidence. The two tale types, ATU 6 and 11, The Gifts of the Demons, and ATU 882, The Wage on the Wife's Chest. <coughs> Generalized 12 tales by all four male narrators, the stories begin with an arranged marriage. Um, I'm going to Skip this part. Um, basically, these are stories. I'll summarize them anyway. These are stories in which there are two young people, um, and uh, they, they have an arranged marriage, and everything's fine with them. But um, uh, eventually, the, the young man is sent away um, with the ship, and, and basically, he loses the ship, um, and, uh, and eventually, the girl has to uh, find him and bring him back. And, and basically it becomes a story of this young woman's empowerment, basically, and, and the way that, again, yeah, um, uh, the, the, the man um, seems to fail in, in various ways to, to live up to the, to the full responsibilities of, of a husband. But um, thanks to the wife, uh, things, are, things are restored. So we're going to skip all of that, and uh, we're going to get back to um, the final example. Um, which is back in the world of the, the magic tale. And this story told by Alice Lannan of Placentia, Newfoundland, 
uh, who had, had in fact published her own written version of this story among uh, the, the two other magic tales which she knew. But uh, everything I say here depends on the oral version, which uh, my wife, uh, Barbara Rietti, and I uh, recorded from her in 1999. The tale type is ATU 425A, The Animal's Bridegroom, a subtype of 425, The Search for the Lost Husband. Three sisters, in the care of their grandmother, who wish for husbands. The two elder girls marry handsome men who turn into snakes by night. Kitty, the youngest, marries the big black bull of Hollow Tree, who is a bull by day, but a man by night. They have three children together, each of whom the bull carries away and hides from them. One night, Grandmother takes and burns his bull skin while he, while he is in his human form, and the husband runs away, and the kitty searches for him. On her journey, she stays in the homes of three young women, each of whom seems to have a child of the age of her own missing children. Each woman gives her a magic object. She meets a servant girl trying in vain to wash a blood stain from a man's shirt. It is Kitty's husband's blood and shirt. And when Kitty washes it, the shirt comes clean. The servant takes Kitty to her mistress, a witch, and Kitty discovers that the witch has her husband. Kitty buys three nights with him from the witch by trading the magic objects. But despite her complaint, oh big black bull upon the tree, Three fine babes I bore for thee, and now you will return to me. He does not do it. He is being drugged. On the third night, however, he does not drink the sleeping potion, and recognizes Kitty. He tells her how to kill the witch by waiting until the old woman undresses for bed, then throwing a knife at a black spot on her breast. This destroys the witch who had cursed Kitty's husband, who in reality is Prince, and releases the sisters' husbands from their snake forms. The children are restored to her and all live happily together. So who is this witch? <coughs> Holbeck might have said it was the prince's mother, Kitty's mother. -in the prince can't kill her. Uh, I asked naively, I uh, said, so why can't the prince kill, him, kill her? And she said, well, he was under an enchantment. Well, yes, of course he was under an enchantment. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. um, but beneath that level, he can't kill her because it's his own mother. But Kitty must, if their marriage is to be recognized and restored. One of Holbeck's key concepts is that of the split in which positive and negative aspects of a real world relationship are represented by aspects of fictional characters in the tale world. There are two powerful older women in the tale. The first is the benign grandmother who tries to fail to control Kitty and her sisters as children. The second is the witch who has taken Kitty's husband who keeps him from her, frustrating their romantic relations and parental lives. The whole Becky of reading of this tale would say that these two older women show positive and negative aspects of a mother or a mother in law. A similar situation appears in another of Alice's tales, Open Open Greenhouse, where an old witch keeps a prince in a bag from which she brings him out each night to dance exclusively with her. Eventually, the young hero destroys the witch and wins him as her husband. And, um, yes, um, I was going to say something there, I totally forgot about the last one. <laughs> Holbeck did not intend to say that there was any single interpretation of fairy tales, but that European tales did offer a coherent set of symbolic actions and characters which allowed audiences to make their own linkages between tale fantasy and real life social problems. The daughter in law mother in law relationship was one of the most difficult to manage, especially in the patriarchal agrarian societies of the past, and it is not without its tensions in modern Western societies. And the thing I forgot about was I did ask Alice how she got on with her own mother in law, and uh, she apparently got on very well, you know, so it was just a story. <laughs> <laughs> to conclude, well, one decides that these tales argue that marriage requires a woman to subject herself totally to a man, a fiery self immolation the land of bowls, or display women's ability to control relationships, don't despair, do exactly as I tell you, or optimistically show that young lovers will prevail over the envy and malice of the older generation, may depend on the, the analyst's gender, status, 
or stage in the life course. What is indisputable, however, is that as folk literature they offer rich and complex social texts which argue with playing hard reading. 